I'm looking at um, how great one might be performance. Um, I, I also use Twitter a bit too much. Um, so at the heart of every progressive web app is a responsive site. Built in mobile first, focus these things on how things sit on a small screen, progressively enhanced for the large display and for, more feature, and for, for additional features. However, techniques we use to build mobile first sites are the same we've been using for over a decade. We are still, still, still plugging your elements left to get them to the next one another. We're still sending heights on elements that use your equal heights. And to first go on something, we either use nasty the uh, CSS hack using table cells, uh, or, or we are absolutely positioning. So, so, uh, so um, browsers have been busy implementing new features that enables to build uh, better responsive sites. So today what we're going to do is going to look at, 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 at how we start using new features in 2016. So first up, I, what I want to do is, is, is uh, look at our site content. Because and to start with, I want to read this quote out to you. So content is king. It always has been, it always will be. Content is why users visit your site, subscribe to your newsletters, and follow you on social media. Content is the single most important aspect of your website. So what Bobby is telling us is that we need to be prioritizing our time to spend time on our, our content. And content must work on a wide variety of devices. Uh, so we need to work responsibly. We, so I, I got the... Um, the global statistics for um, different devices, and, and, and globally, we have a 54% of users on desktop, a huge 41% are on mobile, and 5% uh, are coming from tablets. And of course, these are global statistics. Uh, so, so if, if you have access to your Google Analytics at work, you should, you should be looking at your own site statistics to see what your users are using. Take Bing, for example, uh, over 90% of our users are on mobile. So, so, so one, one of the first things you should do in building a response to site is have to do an audit of your site content. An audit of your content is inventory what you include in your page. It's important to do this before you start your extra design. And Jeremy Gerard uh, said something really, really strong about this. So, uh, starting with a website design without content is like creating packaging design without the product. You, can't, you can do your best, but you, but you but who knows if the end concept of the product will truly fit into what you create. And so you need, and, and in order, order, order to um, audit your content, you need to get that content. And this is prob probably um, the hardest part, you need to get stakeholders involved. So, um, so that they give you content up front. And, and often they want to see, see design, see how their content fits in. So you need to get them to do the reverse. They need to be able to provide content for the to be on the site. And of course, you should be prioritizing your content. Having this home content we want to include in our site, we will now look at how we prioritize it. And we're going to use the techniques to do this. So, content is not to be in the same order on every device. Typical responsive techniques, you see content prioritization being considered as an overall piece, rather than the content of individual device types. In reality, what users are trying to achieve when, when visiting your a uh, device one device might be completely different <coughs> to what they're trying to do on another. <coughs> so let's have a look at this in practice. With, with the example of restaurants, we don't want to provide a quick down site, we want to we want to full feature site with shifted content priorities. So we have a um, on our small devices, um, we, we quite have, if you want to sign up you know, at a restaurant, you want to know the phone number, so you can call up call up and find out details. You all you also might want to get directions so you can actually get to the restaurants. You might be want to find a restaurant to buy and get a coffee. You also you, you may might want to make a, a booking and then sort of like menu atmosphere because that's important because you, you're more like you're more likely to be doing something immediate. Whereas uh, on a large device such as a desktop, you're likely at home or at an office planning for a um, a future event. So you want to know about the atmosphere. Um, you also might want to look at the menu. So say you're you have any dietary requirements, you probably want to look at. Um, whether there are cases for them. I find it's a lot in my son's Syria. Um, and then, um, then you might want to be able to call up and look at the fans in the direction. So I've got different design skills, I'm really not a designer. Uh, but in practice, it might be like this. So, so, so on, on, on mobile, we, we, we've led the phone number in the header. And then we've got big, big call to action to say how to get to the restaurant and how to get the table. <laughs> But and this is how it transforms to large devices. So you've got, so we're leading with big, bold imagery uh, to, 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 to tell the user what the, the, the restaurant offers. So then, 
Then we below, we put the menu and book it in directions. To build content based uh, in this way, we, we, we did a specification called CSS Flexbox Box, um, Flexible Box Layout Module Level 1. And, 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 um, and we can use this for reordering our content. So if you look at this code, we've got, you've got a wrapper on the outside and, t and, 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 and two elements inside. So um, we're going to build it mobile first, the content mobile first, and then that's content. Then using a media query, we can then reorder that content. So on the on the right we set the the, 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 the um, <coughs> with a directional column, but the content is stuck stuck on one another. Then we have our we then need to fire order, so we set the five position one um, for the con desktop content and or two for um, mobile content. <coughs> Aside from looking at how you're prioritizing content, you should also be looking at how you ensure the content is scalable for a wide variety of devices. On large devices, navigating sites is often really easy. If we take a look at the Sony site, for example, it has a very clear navigation through key areas of business. And if you, if you can't see, see what you're looking for, there's a snake box, which would be a quick type. type. Proportionally, on the majority of small devices, navigation on site becomes a lot less obvious. We're hiding our navigation in, in both menus, we're, we're hiding it from our users. So, again, yeah, look at the Sony site again. Um, the navigation is completely inside the hamburger menu. In addition, there's no easy way to see that I can search that site. So what I've done is I, I, made, some, I made some changes. Um, again, for the design skills. Uh, but I moved the um, key menu items underneath the, um, underneath the logo. This is enabled me to remove the, the Hamburg menu completely and, 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 and place a um, search button there. So, so to the user, they have to see what Sony is about. They can see it's an electronic brand, it's an entertainment brand. And they, <coughs> and of course, it is a stop. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is we've shifted down our content slightly, but with, with um, the, the, the current trend in, 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 in devices getting uh, taller, um, that isn't as much of an issue as it would have been on the original iPhone. So, uh, large devices also have more space for content, but, uh, but this does not mean you should be hiding content on small devices. In, in particular, you don't want content to be inaccessible. Someone could be coming from, to your site from Google, see some content in, in, in that individual part of the, um, in the search, but they're not be able to reach it if you've hidden it. So this is a, is a great example of the GLH site. So they, they, what they've done is they've had this big, uh, big map which tells, it tells you uh, where they're headed. However, when you come across on a small device, all you've got is the address. Whereas what they could have done is they could have put a, ma a, a thumbnail of the map next to the address which the user could have clicked on. So you see, so change the functionality, not going to move features. So instead of thinking of oh, oh, think, think a way that you can change functionality to better suit the device, never remove, re remove content completely. Having prioritised our content and considered how, how we ensure our content is responsive, we now look at how we lay out our content. So the responsive design has led us to build the components to be good. Enabling our components to scale to different device sizes we are able to support. So, but until recently, we've been doing this through Jordan and those hacks that I talked about earlier. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at um, how Flexbox can now help us to, um, to, to, to avoid hacking our code. The, the, the first example is Input Item. So, this is where you have an um, a, 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 a input box which has a button, a button, like a button added to it. Um, the uh, button is like fixed width, whereas the rest of the field has to be fluid. So, in order to achieve this, what we do is we, we, we wrap both the input and the button in, in, in another element, and set this to display flex, setting the input field to have a flex of one. And then this means that the while well, the is fixed width, the rest of the space is taken up by the vertically <coughs> sensitive content. So, the, so, so, so this, this is something that's always uh, helping me that wasn't supported by CSS to begin with. Um, so, we might have some content, maybe it's a live box that needs to be sent to the screen. Um, and then in, um, but now we're doing flex box, so we can set we have an align element which is set to display flex. Then we select a align item center, just by the content center. And then what I've done here, I've also added a max width to the align content, because that content would otherwise be full width of the browser, and it'll actually uh, keep it. So um, quite often um, when you're rebuilding sites, you, you might have the occasional short page. Um, and when the footer, footer sits right un underneath the content on a tall, on a tall device, you, you, it looks a bit strange. So, 
and, and there's, uh, there's been a few hacks to, to get around this before, but for the place for things to be easier. So what you do is, you, is uh, I only pass the site to my body and set it to display flex. I then use MinHide's um, or uh, VH. Uh, so VH is um, is a percentage of the viewport height, so that's 20% of the viewport height, and set it to flex over the top. Then I remove the the then I remove my limits from the body, um, and then on our site content, we set it to flex one, so that any remaining space is taken up by that rather than on the footer. Cool. Great. <laughs> so, so, so great, great to be important to our websites. Designers love them because they, 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 they enable them to be really consistent with their pages. Um, but they're usually made up of fl fl floats and, um, and, and like paddings and clay fixes, which is all messy. So now we can have a, um, a, 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 a div, which is a we, we, we wrap up with a grid, and then we have multiple cells. And then we can set the grid to play flex. And then, if we set the flex to one, all the uh, grid cells within it will, will, be, will, will be evenly uh, split to, uh, inside. Unless you want to set one in, in particular as being awkward. So, what you can do here, what I've done here, is I've actually added an inch class called grid cell R and set it to width, if you send. So, the range space is then uh, split evenly between the grid cells, but they're, they're both set to flex one. So, the, the flex one is kind of like a weighting. Uh, so how, 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 how do you measure the success of this content optimization? The, 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 the simple thing to do is invite some users in to their office hands and test your site. And as you use test your site, you're able to measure their specific response to how you adapt the content to your site across each different device. You don't have to build your site to do this. What you can do is, is simply take them through your wiring. Alternatively, if you do want to bring people into your office, you can just go onto the street. So I, uh, once I went out into Starbucks, um, and, I, um, and, and, and I, I spoke to the manager, and they, they let me test some, some stuff I've been working on with, they, with, with some of their customers. And I just gave them the five times refractory for testing the site. So for their time, they got better, but in return, I got, I got some really valuable results. And this actually, what I found is this actually worked just as well as bringing people into your office, and it can be a lot cheaper. Um, and by the way, you put, when your stuff goes out into the real world, you might have multiple versions of the component you want to test, so you can A-B test them. So this is where you have two more versions of the component, and you show each of the different usages in your site. You are then able to, to, to measure, measure, measure success in each component to see if, what the user gets from it. they complete their goal on the site. So just, just, just do you tell them the problem. Yeah. So content is king, and with approximately 46% of users not using your respective browser, we need to make sure that content is optimized for all the Now, so all the way to the and the thing that's there. Okay? Uh, cool. So, um, having looked at the uh, content of site, we'll now focus on the performance, because we want to show that content that we've, that we've optimized so well to our users as fast as possible. So, the three key types of performance are important to the website. So, the first one is rendering. So, this is the time it takes for the uh, browser start rendering. Then we have page loader forms. So this is the time it takes to load a page and people will interact with This is a way to download all your assets. Um, I have a new page. And then we have the C performance. So this is kind of between the two. So, um, and this is where the, 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 the perception that the user gets of the forms of the site, so when they feel that the, the, that website is usable. So this has got a new website on a slow 3 g connection. So you see after 4 seconds, um, the, the um, content starts to load. At 7 seconds, the images, the images are starting to come in. So the user, so the user they're, they're, that page is, is uh, interactable. Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the time is still ticking. And this is actually because the ad is taking very long to the time to load. So at 32 seconds, eventually we'll have to add those. <coughs> okay, look at that. I don't think you can see, you can see some adverts. Um, so why should I care about performance on my site? I was on site with Vex work on a wide variety of internet connections. I use it to be in, in, in their office at work on a really fast connection. Or they can be out in the countryside or camping or something uh, on a 2G connection, and they still expect your site to work. They still want to be able to get to your content. And from a financial point of view, it can really affect your business. So Amazon found every 100 millisecond delay in loading a page cost them 1% in sales. So in 2014, Amazon revenue totaled $89 billion. So 1% of that would be $900 million. So that's not small amount of money that they would they lose. Uh, and then Google found an extra 5 100 milliseconds delay in loading of search results decreased 
calculated by 20%. So that's 20% less adverts that they can show their users. The trend of the last few years, however, has been a page of increasing weight. Um, if you look at average page weight, it's been increasing year on year. In 2013, uh, it was 1, 000, April 1411 kilobytes. But, but in April 2016, it was 2296 kilobytes. So that means the average page weight is, is, is bigger than the entire of the Doom game that was in images and code. It's insane. And if you look at, take a look at imagery averages, we see the biggest culprits of, of increasing our page size are, 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 are image, is, is imagery. So our, our website size can be very image rich. And, and it shows, we have got to have 1.3 uh, mega images. And then, three, and then the second after that, we have our JavaScript at 354k. And the average time to start rendering is also increasing. In between the March 2014 and August 2015, the time to start rendering increased by 48%. And this is the perceived performance of page, because that's the time it takes them to start, start to be able to see something. <coughs> so what steps can I take to improve my site performance? The, the first step, that for we even build our site, is it, it's, it's, it's to create a performance budget. A performance budget relates to the size of assets on our page. And, and, and it's, 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 it's applied to the, the far size of assets our page use based upon the connection speed of our users, along with the maximum time on page to play. So, so I think I like said this really well. The purpose of a performance budget is to make you focus on performance throughout the project. So we need to go through the trouble in the first place because you want because you want to build a site that feels fast to your visitors. As a start of your project, you need to understand what metrics you want to achieve. And, so that, and then you use these to put together a performance budget. So as we're building a response site, today for example we'll aim to start rendering in five seconds on a slow 3G three G connection. So to, to start with, we need to find slow 3G. So web page test defines this as 96 kilobytes per second. And this is a is, is a it commonly used tool testing website speed. Uh, I'll, I'll take that as a trusted source. Uh, so as we also load our site in five seconds, uh, 96 kilobytes times five seconds is 48 kilobytes, so that's our budget. So we can then split our, that, that budget across our assets. So the, these are figures that I quickly put together. So th that's 30 kilobytes for HTML, because I'm, this is an article page, so it's going to be quite a long article. Um, then we have 40 kilobytes for CSS. This allows us to provide rich, rich visual layouts, and 50 kilobytes for JavaScript. If we then decide we want to add web posts to our website, we can then adjust our budget. So um, my designer told me what's the font for the page is 60k. So I need to um, uh, so, so adjust my the budget, so I reduce my images down. These figures seem very ambitious when compared to like, the image of the average we looked at earlier, but the, 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 there's another step we can take to reduce these figures. Uh, you want to calculate your own budget as a website, or the budget I am, um, which will enable you to uh, quickly calculate your own budget. Um, this is the, so the first thing you do to performance is, is often how you load your assets. So providing uh, different images for different group sizes can be done with the picture elements. And it doesn't make sense to load a 1,000 pixel wide image for a device with maximum screen size of 20 pixels. And this is where the picture element comes in. It allows to specify different images for different people's sizes. So there's many ways to use the picture element. In this case, I'm using media queries. So I want, I want to control the art direction of the uh, image shown. So I, what I've got is a large image, which has got a media, a media attribute of um, width of and we have a second source at the source, which is media width 60 pixels. And if not, none of those two media queries are uh, equal the expression to match, the, uh, the, the fact the image is low, low. Cool. So this is a video of, of, of uh, Chrome downloading different versions of a um, shirt, a video of a shirt. Um, so basically, what, what happens is um, the browser the browser support the picture runs will only download the image the browser needs. So there is yeah, the browser the browser you don't have to network and download the correct version. So use the picture on your site. You will need to include polyfill, which is called picture fill. If you if you're already using the Financial Times polyfill service, it's fully supported by that. Um, but what you'll see is as long as you don't have to support IE, it's actually pretty well supported across the board. So. Um, the next thing you can do is, 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 is take a step further and further loading of both the image and video to, to, to improve the initial page load. So, so by preferring them to not part of your, your, main, your initial page, page project. 
the, 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 most, the most common content is very low because images. So the hard thing is this great, this ten is great stats. When, when the, the page first loads, you also see the first images of the page. But if you scroll down, those images actually are being loaded as you scroll. I think that's JavaScript, so I can actually capture the screenshot. Um, in cases where loading assets was preferred, it's important to ensure a suitable placeholder in place. So the Guardian site, they've actually um, or, uh, predefined what the image sizes are, so they don't have to, um, so the pages have to jump when you click for those. In phone loading of hot content, uh, other, other, other images that will be available for you is page budget. So simply for loading assets is a new thing, and it, it's not very revolutionary at all because people have been doing it for a while. But we can now defer the loading content. So, con so back to what I said earlier, content is the heart of your site, but not all content is completely equal. Let's take a look at the metro, which I don't read, it's just a video example, as a deferred loading of content. So uh, as, as it's shown on the page on mobile, what happens is that it, it, the, page, the page starts to bring in uh, related content. Um, and this is all on loaded after the page load, so you don't have to associate this. So if you now see that it's never downloaded. On large device, however, there is a sidebar that runs alongside of content. And uh, because this additional content is not needed for small devices, and it's not critical to user experience, what they've done is they actually uh, they delay it. Delay it. Delay that until after the job, which is like, loaded. So the content is deferred, and, uh, and in this case, it must be articles. And um, it, it, the deferred content this way prevents the browser from loading the content as I've The biggest danger of deferred content is that if JavaScript fails to load, the content that that is deferred will not be loaded. So while again not a responsive site, the total business site is a prime example of where too much content has been deferred. When JavaScript fails to load, the user, the, the, the user is not rendered any content at all. So that looks like it's completely unusable. So we should therefore be very careful with what content we, we choose to defer loading. Of course, the biggest advantage of deferring content is that we are able to reduce the size that we need to deliver to, 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 to our users. So that, that, any, that additional space is not part of our course budget. So, in summary, building a progressive web app is, is about much more than building a site that works across mobile, tablet, and desktop. So, it's much more than simply adding a manifest to your, your project and adding a service worker. You need, you need to be adapting the user experience of sites so the goal of the device the user get the best experience possible. When building a progressive web app, we need to spend time focusing on the content and the performance. We need to make sure the content is the best content that we, we can deliver them, and we need to deliver them as fast as possible. And we need, it needs to be prioritized. So the, we, we need, you need to take into account what the, the user's priorities are when, when visiting your site. And all of this should be scalable. And finally, the, percep the perception that our users have of your site should be there in loads fast. We don't want our users to have a bad experience at the web. Cool. So the Flakebox example is worth taking from Salt by Flakebox. Um, I say, thank you to my wife, Charlie, uh, Kate, who's always reads my slides. I'm being late. And I've worked done in the, 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 all this with the whole set of everything. <coughs> <coughs>